it's a time of change and change brings opportunity. Business of Architecture, episode 372. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking with Jeff Ross. Now, Jeff is a real estate development executive who has an interdisciplinary expertise. He has both been trained as an architect and has worked in several architectural offices in New York City. And then he transitioned to the ownership and development side, where he has worked with some of the largest and most active New York City developers. He's had projects come out of the ground in several US states and has repositioned assets in New York City of over $3 billion. So this was a really fascinating conversation to see behind the scenes of how developers work with architects, how they approach and hire architects, what they're looking for, what makes a successful collaboration, mistakes architects often make when they're trying to find work with uh, developers, and how developers can actually take advantage of architects if they're not properly prepared. And we also speculate on the future of real estate in a post-COVID world and the numerous business opportunities that may be presenting themselves for architects. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Jeff Ross. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Jeff, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you on this fine morning? I'm very good. Good morning or good afternoon where you are. Absolutely. You've gotten up very early to speak with me. So thank you very much. You're yeah, happy to be here. Awesome. And you're, you're based in New York. And you've had, a, you've had a really varied and interesting career and you've got a huge amount of expertise in architecture and the real estate markets. Uh, I guess my first question is, how would, how would you describe your, your role? How would you describe your expertise? It, it's, it's varied. It, it changes depending on what the position is. Um, you know, wrapping it up as, as real estate executive is probably the easiest thing because it, mm. it, it, it forces one to not ask too many questions. <laughs> but uh, on, the, on the easy side of things, it's, it's, it's sort of project management, complex project management. It's, it's, running the teams um, who hire the architects and the contractors and the engineers to, to get stuff done. Mm. And that getting stuff done is, is repositioning assets, um, redoing buildings, existing buildings so that they look better, yep. uh, bringing new buildings out of the ground, um, uh, assessing potential buildings for purchase in addition to a portfolio. Yep. Uh, and the assessing could be, you know, what is the existing building like or what could it be? You know, what can we what's the least amount of money we can spend on this to make it look as good as possible to attract the highest rent over what it's currently getting. And how did you enter into this world? Rather, um, rather through the back door in a way. Uh, I started off as an architect. I went to school for, for architecture and I worked in numerous offices as an architect and yeah. I did uh, apartments, I did restaurants, I did MRI facilities, which are quite fascinating. Um, I did retail, I did offices, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And I was working on a national account for an international luxury brand and was flying around the country to make sure that their stores were opening up on time and following the design um, and the details of the drawings, et cetera, et cetera. And I flew from New York to Maryland one day, rented a car, got to the job site, made sure everybody knew what they were doing, made sure that things were according to the, the drawings that we had set out, got back into the car, flew back to New York and was on the plane thinking to myself, I was the lowest paid person there of of the plumbers, of the tin knockers, of the site supers, of everybody. I'm like, I was the lowest paid person there. I need to make some changes. Yeah, the, the realization of the architect. <laughs> exactly. It's, that's exactly what it was. I mean, it's a lovely profession. It's a lovely education. But yeah. 
it pays like a school teacher mm. and I, I wanted more. Yeah. So I had a friend who was also an architect and was working with a real estate developer on a bunch of projects. And he said, oh, hey, they're looking for somebody. So uh, I went in, I had an interview. Um, the job seemed to be pretty good. And so I started that, I think like maybe two or three weeks after the trip to Maryland. And yeah, my salary jumped by about 50%. Wow. It and what was, was, what was the change in role? The change in role was, was, it was a broadening of role. Right. And that felt great. I mean, at the architecture office, architecture, you go through steps, you know, you're, you're the junior person and then you're the, 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 the CAD operator drawing, drawing, drawing. And then you turn into sort of the project manager and, you know, the senior project manager and quasi partner, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And each step gains more responsibility. Um, but as soon as I went to the development side of things, I was doing what the senior project manager would be doing, but then there was also an eye on what does the leasing team need out of it? And what does the financial team need out of right. it? And what is the potential value of the building? So uh, in an architecture office, the roles sort of keep expanding. You know, I, I remember really good days in an architecture office where you're drawing all day and you can have your headphones on and it's, it's almost meditative. Yeah. And at a certain point you can't do that. And the, the stretch into the developer role was you definitely can't do that because you're on the phone all the time because you're, you're coordinating with a bunch of other people. So it was, it was a widening of the circle. Right. So instead of just dealing with the architects, cause you now hire and, and manage architects, you're also dealing with, all the other aspects of a project that, um, you know, banks, loan officers, uh, money, you're dealing with the money side and um, money's got to get paid. So it's multifaceted. Everybody wants a piece of that. And there's a yeah. lot of departments of money. Well, this is really interesting. You know, um, the, the difference as well in, in salary when you move over into the development side. And obviously here now you're talking about essentially the business agenda behind buildings and also starting to understand that buildings are for the for the most part in every kind of in every building that gets built there is a business case behind it and they are used as financial instruments and often architects are not we don't enter into that world often we kind of either shy away from it and don't understand it necessarily which is a great shame because that's 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 that's, that's what drives it you know yeah. the the owner of the building is not building the building to make the sexiest building imaginable or to make the most pedagogically ideal building imaginable. Mm. They're building a building to make money, you know? And if, if by making it the most sexy building imaginable or the most pedagogically ideal building imaginable, if that's how you're going to get the most money out of it, then that's what they're going to do. But at the same time, you know, if, if, if they can make it out of, of gingerbread and jelly beans and make the most money out of it, that's what they'll do too, which is, which is also why you see the our, our, our cities around the world are in some cases blighted with just tragic, tragic, you know, brick and small window buildings because in somebody's accounting book that made the most money. Yeah. Got it. And and when you moved over to the development role, what were some of the new skills that you were having to learn or or and which parts of it did you kind of just naturally feel like okay, this is this is better than architecture or I'm I'm great at this? Um, I don't know if I would say that it struck me as I'm great at this. I mean, there's anytime you try something new, there's the fear of, am I doing this right? Yeah. Am I doing this right? Uh, and I think that the biggest thing was, was just getting your head around the, the money aspect of it mm. and the, the million facets of the money aspect of it. Right. So there's the, the aspects of, of the, the debt side of things and, and how much money is going to be put in up front and how that's coming out. Like the, the debt stack, the debt stack is probably the biggest, the biggest piece of it. Right. Right. Because any large property or portfolio um, has not just a investor or not just a mortgage, you know, it has a mortgage that's covering a certain amount and then it has, um, you know, a mezzanine loan on top of that, which is just a bit of money to get you through from one thing to another. And then there's like a, 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 a class A investor on top. There's, there's, there's any piece has like six or seven slices at least, if not more to it. And each one of them has a different need or valuation. So the, the hardest part, I think the part of shift was 
um, tracking all of the specifics because mm-hmm. if you're doing something new or if you are uh, doing a project where the, the debt obligations have specific triggers to them, you've got to be mm-hmm. aware of what all of them are to make sure that you don't fall over any of them um, and put yourself in default. Got it. And that, that was probably the biggest one because it was, uh, it was almost like a bit of a game. It was like a little bit predatory. Mm. And to shift from, oh, this is window detail, right? To, <laughs> oh, 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 crap. There's somebody who's like trying to take the property away because they think they can get in on like a certain tweak of the debt stack. Then that was, that was something. You know, to, to that point, the, 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 the game always goes on. I mean, we had uh, one office I worked at. There was, it was um, a retail space, two floors, I think $279 million. Mm. It was in construction. So we would purchased this, this two-floor condo unit from the developer of the building, and we were redeveloping the unit itself. And there was all sorts of, like, catches and triggers in this 400-page this agreement. And one of them was revolving around elevators. There were supposed to be four elevators put in at a location to be determined. And nobody had determined where they were because nobody had taken space yet. So the owner of the building had to give us notice, I think like five days in advance of when they were going to do something and we had to agree to it. And if they didn't, then he would put stuff wherever he wanted and the cost was on us. Right. So our legal team called us up at probably, I think, uh, 1130 at night on Christmas Eve because someone had been sitting in the office and just received a fax. And the fax, the fax was a notice from the developer that this was happening. And like, you dirty, sneaky rat, you know? You're, <laughs> this, this is, if we don't say yes to this or acknowledge this, it's going to cost us $4 million that you don't have to worry about. So you wait till 1130 at night on Christmas Eve and you send it out by fax. Like, oh. wow. So you, you got to be on the lookout for that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously you're operating in the climate in New York, probably one of the most fiercest property markets anywhere on the planet. Um, how, how did your, how did your architectural sensibility and design knowledge and expertise um, facilitate what, what kind of, what, how did that assist you? in entering into the world of development details 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 right the the role of the architect is to uh, be thinking about all of the pieces and how they all fit together and how they could go wrong if they do and in development it's the exact same thing so it's it's just details right so if if you're looking for all these details in architecture uh, you just have to think in a larger scope so it's not just how does the the, the door fit the frame or the, the column hit the beam. It's, it's how does the, the building hit the balance sheet? Right. And you just have to stretch your mind a little bit to, to think about how the details of all these other things swirling around come together as well. So I think that it's, it's architecture is, is it's an amazing education or amazing profession because it allows you to think critically about so many things. Sometimes too critically is one of the downfalls of architecture. Um, but it also allows you to, to think about the details of things. And if you just sort of reposition what those details are, mm. uh, you're well set up for it. What, what would be your advice to architects who are working and liaising with developer clients, things that they could do better or, mm-hmm. or, or to phrase that in a better way, things that they could do to have better relationships or get, or have better projects delivered for architects specifically there's there's basically two things and one of them is not architecture specific but it's important and it's um tell me something i don't know you know i have i have a thousand consultants on a given day and there's architects there's engineers there's um like i've said before leasing people loan people money Mm -hmm. people uh, asbestos people, uh, tax people, blah, blah, blah. The list is, list is infinite. Um, and I haven't hired the consultants to just execute what I want them to do. I mean, I'm, people get paid very well to, in my mind, tell me what I don't know. Right. You know, I want someone to come in and like, Hey, 
Jeff, you know, what you're doing there, that's, that's great. And what you want us to do, we're happy to do all day long, but have you thought about this? And when somebody walks in and says, have you thought about this? And I'm like, oh, wow. No, right. I didn't think about that. And yeah. that's really useful. That's great. Like, I, I don't mind if someone says, hey, have you thought about this? I'm like, no, that, that, that's what, what are you, why are you telling me that? That makes no sense. That's okay. Because for every, you know, five, six, seven of those, there is one where you're like, oh, I didn't think about that. Yeah. So, and this doesn't go for architects. This goes for all consultants. Tell me what I don't know. Right. I know what I know. Tell me what I don't know. I'm not paying you to tell me what I do know. Well, this is really interesting. How, how, how would you suggest that consultants or other architects find that out? <laughs> oh, and, 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 and what are the sort, what are the sorts of sweet spots, if you like, where perhaps your knowledge ends and the architect's domain begins or the, or the value that architects can bring to, to these types of development projects? Oof. It's, that's a tough question because it varies on so many, on so many levels. Like the, although so many of these projects are, you'd think repetitive, they're always, they're always different in some way. And the same way, like a, you know, any architecture project, you know, everyone's done a thousand and one offices or a thousand and one houses or a thousand and one restaurants or uh, any of these things, but every single one of them is a struggle to a certain degree. Mm. And, and when you think about it, it shouldn't be. It's like, oh, well, this is a house. I just it's like, I did that other house. It should just be like that one. And it never is because that's, that's just the nature of being human. Everything yeah. is broken all the time. You know, we're, we're, we're slightly better monkeys and that's it. <laughs> and, and if everything went, went smooth or as planned, then whole swaths of the world would be unemployed. You wouldn't have like project managers or you wouldn't have fixers. You wouldn't have all these things. It's like, oh, well, you know, I've designed that. Well, I love that. That's a great design. Well, let's execute it. Let's give it to the contractor. Is he giving us the right price? We don't have to worry about it. Of course, he's giving us the right price and we're going to build it and there will be no problems constructing. Like, no, we don't live in that world. It's yeah. So in the same sense, um, is there like any sort of trick to you know, being a better consultant on things? No, because every single project is going to be different. The best thing is just, you know, do what you do. This is terrible advice, but it's because it's so anodyne, but like do what you do and do it well. Yeah. And, you know, be smart about what you do. And I'd probably say the biggest thing is like, look at the bigger picture. Right. You know, don't just look at, at what your, your remit is. Look at your remit plus, like, step out of sphere, step back, take a step back, look, look at the, the bigger picture, widen your circle, all of those things. Mm. And, and that's where the, the real value comes from. And, and that's like what, what you're saying, when, when architects particularly engage with the financial aspects or start to understand what the financial constraints are from the developers, this is when solutions can become a lot more interesting. And certainly be, you'll be able to present design ideas in alignment with the business cases of developer clients. It, it helps, right? Like it's, you don't want to be chasing like the, the lowest price or the fastest thing or any of those things. Like that's, that's not right. the case. You know, I'm, I'm working with a client right now, a, a large bank that's doing a very large portfolio repositioning. Right. And I was on a call They're They're actually leveling out six architects for, I think it's like a hundred million dollars worth of work. And the, the bids are all pretty close, but in the end, the, the bids aren't really what, what is driving the selection process of the architects. You know, they're, they're all equally sized. They're all equally talented. They're, they've all done similar scopes of projects. Any one of these groups could be perfect for the job. Hmm. And one of the people actually said, it's like, look, $200,000, $300,000. Like, okay, but are we going to get something that we like more for two or $300,000? Like, is there a little bit more design power there? So, you know, people are willing to spend money if they're going to get something out of it. So it's, right. it's not about architects should never be thinking like, how do I deliver the cheapest product? Like, yeah, no. yeah, absolutely. No, it's, it's how do you deliver the best product? And if the best product comes with a price tag, how can you justify the price tag? Now that that's really interesting. Right. So you, you you know, you've given that example with the client and you've got a number of architects, they're all equally talented and brilliant. And there's a, a, a sort of much of a fee discrepancy or not? Not a whole lot. 
not a whole lot. And how, how, how then do you make a decision? What are the sorts of things that kind of make you decide we're going to go with this architect as opposed to this architect? Well, some of it's obvious, you know, like uh, does the architect have experience with the work being done? Right. So, right. you know, the, the, in this particular case, being a bank, there's a trading floor involved and trading floors are a little bit messy. You know, there's, there's a high technical aspect to it. There's a high HVAC aspect to it. Um, and if you haven't done one, there's a bit of a learning curve. So yeah, like one firm has done eight trading floors and the other one's done two. So that makes sense. But then there's also, there's a bunch of other qualifications that come into it that uh, it's like job hunting in a way too, right? So you're, you, you're sitting in a room with people and like, well, should we give it to firm A or firm B? It's like, well, firm B has just had some of their senior people leave. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They moved over to firm C, huh? So who's at firm B? Who's leading firm B right now? Oh, I don't know. And you're like, oof. Maybe we don't give them like tier A. Maybe we give those guys tier B because- That's so interesting. There's, right. there's, there's a social network and there's a politic to it. And mm -hmm. part of it's New York. I mean- uh, New York works on, on who you know and, and, and deep connections and probably a lot of the world does too but yeah. um, there's still sort of a, a leftover bit of, of what can you do for me rather than just what the price is so um, yeah the, 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 the judgments are made not purely on the money although it's a huge factor Yeah, but they're also made on 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 what level of service you can expect from people. Got it. And, and that goes, you know, we, we disqualified a firm once because their hourly rates were too low. You know, that was, that was part of the RFP where we're looking at these architects and again, all equally talented, yep. all, all capable of doing stuff. And um, one firm had, you know, on average, they were billing like $400 an hour for their people. Now, again, like we don't know what they're paying their people because the hourly rates, they, they could be giving everybody free breakfast and lunch and, mm -hmm. and their offices in like some sort of super luxury building, but you, you don't know for sure. But if one guy is at 400 bucks an hour, three people are like 325, 300 an hour, something like that. And then there's one guy who's rolling in at, at 110 an hour. Like, who's he got working for him? <laughs> right. He's either, he's either got the, the cheapest space possible and, and everybody is working with abacuses and etch-a-sketches yeah. or, or he's not retaining the best talent or if he has the best talent, they're not there for long because they're going to go to the other place that's spending $400 on free lunches, luxury office space and a higher salary. Yeah. So the, the, the decisions that go into choosing the architecture, they're myriad. So fascinating. You mentioned earlier about the, you know, the, the, what else you, can you do for me? Mm -hmm. What, what sorts of things might that encompass? Is that part of the service or is it kind of who you can introduce us to? Or it's usually, it's, it's usually part of the service, right? You, you want somebody who has uh, an understanding of the project um, and an understanding of, of what you do. Yeah, you you want you want somebody who's um, who's just it again. It goes back to just thinking a little bit bigger. Mm. It really comes down to that, um, looking at what their role is, but also looking at, at what you need and and who the other people are. And it's a bit of, it's a bit of role playing, right? Like any any project that an architect has brought on for tenants, and they could be office tenants or residential tenants or mm. residential buyers of a, of a condo development or housing development, whatever. Like it's all about somebody who's going to occupy space and pay someone else money for that space. Yeah. So you got to role play. You got to, you got to role play. Like who are these people? Who are these people renting this office? Who are these people who are going to walk through this lobby every day? Who are these people who are going to buy this house? Who are these people who are going to uh, use the amenity in this residential space? And you're, you're, as an architect, who's ever hiring you is, is going to give you a brief. You know, these people are this or these people are that, whatever it is. But at the same time, you've got to sort of stretch your mind and like, yeah. Coming back to, I mean, this is really interesting about how architects get picked 
by developers and the things that developers are looking for with with their architectural teams and their consultant teams and the value that architects can bring to a project. What recommendations would you say to say newer or younger practices or, or even mature practices that don't have say experience in a particular project typology, like you were saying, you know, given the example of the trading floor, but say they've got experience in other projects, how can they start to, you know, what would be the kind of key elements there to starting to broach a, a project like that or liaising with a developer that would give them the opportunity to be involved in such a, a project where they perhaps don't have the the project experience? Well, that's a tough question. And, you know, that's, uh, it, it's it's almost like um, job hunting when you're in your early 20s. Like, <laughs> how, do you, how do you, how do you get experience without having a job and how do you have a job without having experience, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's basically that, it's that question. Yeah. Um, look, um, have energy, have organization, um, have some ideas. You know, uh, not too long ago, there was, for larger projects, when you're bidding out to, to multiple architects, the architects come in and they do a little bit of a, a song and dance. You know, there's a, a slide deck and projects they've accomplished or things that they've done, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the contractors too, contractors do this as well for big projects too. Um, and, and when the, the presentation is, is, you know, good, it's like, oh, there's some, some sexy projects and the, the team like hands off well from one to the next to the next, that, that's great. Um, but so often there's architects who just, you know, architects are terrible communicators. They're just, it's, I don't know if there's a, a larger profession of mumblers, um, and, and just, you know, like quiet talkers and no eye contact people and, you know, like step away from the drafting board once in a while. Mm-hmm. So when people come in and, and they have that, that, confidence and that enthusiasm and that that sort of like looking forward to working with you in in, in a sincere way like people who are yeah. excited about what they do and are excited about what they've done and are excited about the ideas that they've got and all that honestly you know that goes a long way too mm. you know, if if frequently there's an old phrase i don't know whose it was but it's uh, people don't know what they want they want what they know yeah and when I've been doing projects where, especially like with, with public facing spaces, like uh, office building lobbies are, are a key one, or, or more importantly, like office building um, uh, corridors and elevator spaces, like the, the, the spaces in the building that people interact with all the time. Um, there's been a push in the last several years for sort of a more hospitality feel to, to commercial space. So you want to strike a balance. Like there's, there's a number of architects I can go to in New York who will give me a classic New York lobby and it's going to look good for the next 20 years. And yeah. it looks the same way that it did 20 years ago before that. And it's probably rooted somewhere in, in 50s, 60s modernism and it's not going to change for a long time. Yeah. And then there's a bunch of other people who kind of come in and they're busting things up. And you look at you like, whoa, and again, back to the point from before, like I didn't think about that. Yes. Yeah. And, and that goes a long way. Like, so every once in a while you're looking at a project and you're like, show me something different. Mm. There was a project years ago that I was working on where um, instead of just like going out to architects, we decided to uh, bring in a couple of artists and you know, what does a lobby look like if it's been designed by Jeff Koons or Olaf or Eliasson or things like that? You know, let's, let's mix it up. I mean, Eliasson did the, was it the Reykjavik Opera House, I think? Yeah. Yeah. And I haven't seen it in person. I've just seen like the, the sexy architectural shots, but there's something to that. Every once in a while, you mix something up. You, you bring in it, fresh was it, ideas. Was it an installation he did there? Or- I I don't know what his remit on the job was, but he's been credited with it. So the, the entry lobby, there's like a lot of sort of tessellated glass. And right. so I, I don't know quite what he did. I've never really dug into it. But I'm like, Oh yeah, he did that. That makes sense. So it's, it's, you know, how do architects win things like come with fresh ideas, 
you know, you don't want to be way, way out there. Sometimes, yeah. you, again, you've got to know what you're walking into. Um, but uh, fresh ideas help. Every once in a while, people are like, yeah, show me what I don't know. Show me, show me, show me next, right? In, in a world of competition where you're trying to create a product that differentiates itself from the rest of the market, mm-hmm. show me next. It's, it's so interesting as well how you, how you say that that kind of foundational communication skills speak tomes. They make a massive difference. That goes for any profession. Yeah. That's, that's just not, that's not an architecture thing. Like the, the person who speaks eloquently, who can tell a good story, who um, has their timing right, has all these things, you know, that's, that's the person who you're going to listen to at the pub. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to, to go a little bit broader here um, and to get your thoughts and speculations on the, on the current state of the market. So mm-hmm. obviously we've had a rather interesting last 18 months or so, or 12 months with our friendly virus who has, we've all got to know very well. And this has caused, you know, all kinds of interesting speculation here in the UK. We've been talking about a property market crash for the last six months. That hasn't happened. In fact, we're starting to see the opposite happen happening. And this is, breeding lots of speculation about opportunities or how industries can be, you know, gearing themselves to, you know, uh, dealing with what's the future of the office market, the future of the home. What are some of your broad thoughts on the the current state of the market and where it's going and opportunities for architects? We're all doomed by gold move to the countryside. (laughs) No, I don't know. Like it, there's, there's, there's so many moving pieces, right? Yeah. Um, retail was in trouble before this hit, and this has crushed retail. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've, I can walk down Broadway in New York below Houston, and the, the number of empty storefronts is something I've never seen. Like I've never, I, I didn't even see that in, in 2009. I didn't see that in like the crash in 2000, 2001. So mm. I look at that, I'm like, woof that's a problem. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a problem because it means that there's a, a large retail base that just isn't there anymore. And the deep pocketed multinational groups, the, the large international chain stores, will they open up again? Sure. You know, they've got access to capital that the average person doesn't. Is the average person who had a store prior to this, that's closed going to come back? Maybe but that's going to require some sort of crazy workout with their landlord because they would have been burning cash for a year. Yeah. Um, so I think that a lot of that's going to go away. Uh, but it means that there's a huge opportunity coming up. There's going to be a lot of, of retail space that's cheaper. Yeah. And maybe that gives people the opportunity to create the store that they always wanted to, you know, like I'm tired of this nine to five thing. I always wanted to open up a, you know, a candle and rubber stamp shop and God damn it, I'm going to do it because I can afford it because the, the rent is cheap. So we, we might, we, hopefully we might see stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's a time of, of new things. You know, the, the whole thing about the, the, you know, internet killed retail is just not true. I mean, yes, it certainly helped, but for the most part, um, um, institutional lending killed retail. I think 40% mm. of the bankruptcies from the last decade or so on, on the chain scale, you know, the, the Toys R Us's and the guitar centers and things like that. The, the, the things that, that killed retail then the last round for the most part were, were hedge funds. They were, they were like hostile takeovers of retail chains that loaded them up with debt that the, the chains just couldn't service. So um, that's a separate, that, that's a whole other economics episode that one but retail is is a problem and also an opportunity the the difficulty with that is the valuation if the value of the building and the loans that have been written on the building are in some way funded by the retail portion of it which in many cases is, is a significant portion then the building could be underwater so make a note of that the building could be underwater put that to the side um offices 10 to 15 percent of the the building 10 to 15 percent occupancy right now in new york of people coming to the office wow um 
it's have you, ever, have you ever seen anything like that before no yeah. no people are still paying the rent for the most part right there's a lot of people who are, who are leaving office space but a lot of them you know there's still grand plans to return there's also grand plans of, of downsizing there's a, a lot of groups who are like mm, do we need six million square feet of office space no we can probably do with four you know so there's an aspect of that um again there's probably going to be a lot of space on the market when we come out of this like nobody knows 100 percent for sure what's going to happen once everybody's vaccinated and the world's back to normal it's 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 going to be i always say that the party that we were always promised in 1999 that never really happened. It's, it's going to be crazy times. It's going to be wonderful. There's going to be, I can't even imagine. It should be pretty good. Um, but does it mean that everyone's going to rush back to the office? Maybe not. Right. You know, I, think, I think that there's probably a, 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 new, a new way to think about working in an office. And we can come back to that one too. But it, and just in the short term, like what does it mean? Well, there's probably going to be a lot of extra office space on the market. So when that happens, you have to be competitive either through what you're offering in the space or by dropping the rent. So rents are probably going to come down. You know, quietly they have been. And if your rents have been coming down, then it changes the valuation of your building and you might be underwater. Right. Right. Residential, people always need somewhere to live. And living and working are pretty much the same right now right so there's been a whole bunch of people who have fled the cities to the countryside for more space you know there's the lifestyle aspect of it too which i think people always sort of experimented with a bit but it was it was largely about space mm. um i'm lucky enough my wife and i we have a place a couple hours north of of new york in the country and <clears throat> If we didn't have this, we would have killed each other. There's no way that two of us could be working in New York City in a one-bedroom apartment and having conference calls. Yeah. So we're very fortunate. We're very fortunate that we have jobs that we can do remotely, and we're very fortunate that we have a, an extra space that we can go to. Um, but I think that a lot of people are realizing that they need they need that space. Yeah. So will they be looking for a larger space? Maybe, but in a city, larger space means more money. You're, you're paying on a dollars per square foot basis. And the, the difference between a, a, a house in the suburbs or a house in the country where oh, yeah, it's got an extra bedroom on it. Eh, yes. It, does it cost more money? Yes. Does it cost radically more money? Probably not. Yeah. But if you're in an urban center where you might be paying a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars $2,000 per square foot of space, you know, a closet is suddenly like a, a, a significant <laughs> luxury. Of yeah. Right. So ha- the idea of having a home office or something uh, dramatically increases the price of things. So are we going to see more people um, fleeing the city? Eh, maybe. Um, I think that probably what we'll see is more people who can afford it getting like the second house as, as somewhere to go. I think we're going to see people returning back to the city because cities are great. You know, assuming, assuming you can see your friends and go to a restaurant and have a drink at a bar, yep. uh, see some live music, go to the theater. Yeah, everyone's going to go back to the cities pretty quickly. And- yeah, it, it, it's, it's interesting. We've had this kind of conversation in the, in the industry about, you know, people are going to be moving out to the country and will cities ever be the same again? And it's kind of like, yeah, cities are great. They really are. We're like, we're all, we're all bored now of, you know, if you're a, if you're a city of file, and you, you know, that's what you live for. You love cities. You love cities. You want to be back in there with people. Of course. You know, look, the cities have been pretty popular for a couple thousand years, <laughs> right? Yeah. The, the specific city changes, but for the most part, cities have been popular for, for thousands of years, despite that they've been like, you know, the, the centers of pestilence or, or grand fires or the targets of wars or all of these things like the, it still draws people. So yes, when we come out of this, cities will still be important. And all the things about cities will still be important. They're just going to be important in different ways that we haven't figured out. And the, the, the cash implications thereof are sort of yet to be determined. And um, how are developers bracing themselves? How are they talking about the future and where to be 
placing money? Are people kind of nervous and holding back with projects and projects going and hold? And are investors timid or is it kind of actually people are seeing a lot of new opportunities and things to be new ideas to be tested? Everyone's still sort of working it out a little bit. The, the residential developers, I don't think, have really slowed down. I think they're, they're, they're repositioning what their product is, right? You know, the, the return to the home office is, is important. The, yeah. the idea of um, if you're in an urban center where real estate is too expensive to sort of afford a, a home office or, to, or it prices your, your target market out of the space, then uh, things like the, the, the butler's desk or the, you know, the, the, the office desk in the kitchen kind of come back or, or um, there's a thing in New York, it might be specific to New York, I don't know, called an alcove studio where it's, it's a one room apartment um, that has an awkward L to it. And, right. Oh, it's a feature. You can tuck the bed in there. <laughs> and really it was just a way to market that space. Um, you know, it's probably going to turn into like the alcove office at this point. And so I think that there's, there's going to be a lot of things like that going on. There's going to be a lot of repositioning of, of, of what the product is on the residential market. The office market is still a little bit murky. What are developers preparing in, in that sense? They're rethinking amenities, right? Okay. So for a long time, you would rent an office and that was the draw. It's like, oh, well, you have space that I can build my business. I'm going to put my business here. Thank you very much. And then that's the base. And so what do you make, what do you have to make the space that you are offering on the market more attractive? And it's like, oh, it's a higher floor or a better building or a view of the park or uh, a lovely lobby. And you know, recently it's been um, sort of the hospitality aspect or uh, the introduction of the third space. And there's always the talk of it's not home, it's not work, it's a third space. And a lot of developers have been in the last couple of years really pushing that third space as um, a series of amenity packages that in an office you, you haven't seen in a long time, mm. um, you'd see them more sort of in residential things. So there's like the lounge space or, and these aren't in office features. Uh, these are sort of in the building features. And there might be like a large lunchroom or a roof deck or a, a terrace or uh, a space to sort of break out. So there's going to be a rethink of what the office amenities look like. They're, they're going to be equally important. There's, there needs to be a reason to entice people back to the office. And yeah. being together again is important. Uh, mentoring younger people is important. Uh, there is an efficiency to it that's important. But is it enough to lure you out of the, the comfort of your home? Um, so the amenity is one of the amenities is going to be safety. You know, yeah, we're going to provide an environment for you that's safe. And we're doing that through, you know, MERV 13 filters and air changes and, um, all sorts of things, touchless systems, but there, there's going to be a focus on what that third space looks like. And it's not just going to be the coffee bar anymore. It's going to be an addition to how you work. That is an extension of your home mm. without being your home. So it's really interesting. And, and what, what opportunities does this present for, for other consultants, for architects? How would you, how would well, you imagine that, they, that people could start preparing or strategizing? Think about, again, think about what's next and, and, and role play it. You know, if, if you're an architect and you've been working from home and your kids are driving you crazy or, 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 or whatever it is, if you're an architect and your, your roommates are driving you crazy, think about what, what, what is it that you would want from life mm. and the space that you work in, you know, put your, put yourself in that space, role play that space. Who are these people who, who's, who are these people who are going back to an office and what do they want? You know, they've, they've left a home. They've, They've taken some sort of, of public transportation, giving everybody the side eye whose mask is a little bit too low. They've arrived at an office. Um, what's it going to take to make them feel comfortable? Yeah. And, and think about the new ideas. Don't just, don't just react to the, the current situation. We all know what the current situation is. What does the situation look like after this? You know, at the start of this, um, when things were sort of shutting down for the very first time and everyone's still figuring it out, all of my architects were calling me up 
and offering planning services. You know, let me show you how this office looks when it's socially distanced and it's like, great. All of my engineers were calling me up and telling me about new filters and UV things. And all of my door hardware people were calling me up and telling me about the, the mix of copper and nickel and the, the metal, which kills germs on the touch surfaces. And all my furniture people were, were calling me up with, with plax, plexiglass screens to put on a desk. Like, great, spectacular. Tell me what's next. Tell me what comes after this. Yeah. Yeah. That's, re that's really interesting. So being, being more visionary almost practically visionary. I mean, architects yeah. always like to be visionary about things like this is the building of the future. It's like, oh, it's the same building we've always had. It's just curved on the edges. Like, no, don't, don't do that. We've all seen that. And it's not fooling anybody. Just put yourself in the role and think about how you're going to do it. Mm. You know, how, how are you going to go to work? What do you want when you get there? How, how do you need your house to be different so that you can work from home? You know, what, what does it look like when you're, if you're working on your, your kitchen counter and every single day you have to build your office and then every single night just before dinner, you have to take your office apart again to make dinner. Is there a better way to do that? Mm. Think about that. You know, is it, is it about space? Is it about... Is it, is it about, is it about space? Is it about how a countertop works? You know, please nobody do things where like the countertop rolls over and transforms or drops out of the ceiling on ropes or something like that's just, that's the architect trying too hard. That's like, you know, wearing the, the German switchblade eyewear and, and thinking about how you can solve it with technical things. Like, no, just how do you live in the space? How do you work in the space? How do you shop in the space? And what does it mean? What does it look like? Yeah. Think about that. Yeah. Brilliant. What's your plans for the rest of 2021 in terms of the sorts of projects you'll be working on and where you're moving um, forward? Well, I am, I am with a project management firm right now, and we are going to be helping a large banking client uh, move from 13 buildings into six and downsize from 6 million square feet to four. Right. Wow. And that is going to take them four years. Bloody hell. <laughs> and that's, yeah, right? And that's not the only one. I think that there is going to be a huge amount of business about how to work more efficiently. Mm. And there's a lot of very large firms that are going to realize they don't need as much space as they do, um, or they, they're going to distribute their space differently. Okay, I can remember at the sort of the, the start of the pandemic, you'd be on, on calls and there'd be so many people on the calls and you get off the call and you're like, mm -hmm. you just weren't essential. Like you just like, you think about the people like, mm -hmm. not essential person. <laughs> and I think that a lot of businesses have come to that conclusion. They've got a lot of people who aren't actually that essential. And, and there have been, a, there's been a round of layoffs. There's been a round of layoffs in the, in uh, the architecture industry, which is reflective of the amount of work that's being done. And, and it's, 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 it's global. Yeah. And some of those jobs are going to come back. Some of them won't. Mm. And it's not, it's not like 20% of the population is going to be unemployed forever. There's going to be a thousand one other things that will start up and, and hire those people. But um, companies have downsized and they're going to stay down for a while and their space requirements are going to change to go with it. Fascinating. Brilliant. I think that's a, a good place for us to conclude the conversation this morning. Oh, we should have a more optimistic note than that. <laughs> what, is, is, there, is there an optimistic note for the future? Yeah, of yeah. course there is. Of course there is. Like, it's, a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a time of change. It's a time of change and it's a time of opportunity. Um, we don't necessarily know what it's going to be. You know, yeah. yes, there's a thousand and one empty storefronts. There's a bunch of people who are very, very concerned that they're not going to go back to their desks and their, their office buildings are not going to be worth anything. Um, uh, the residential brokers are still rubbing their hands and stuff in their pockets, but um, it's a time of change and time, change brings opportunity. We don't, know, we don't know what it looks like. And, and that's scary, but that's, that's the magic of it because it means that we can't imagine what's coming. Yeah. And when it, when, when it gets here, it'll be like, Oh, I didn't think of that. Yeah. 
And that's, 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 that's genius, right? You know, a good idea is like, oh, I could have thought of that. Why didn't I think of that? Genius is like, I never would have thought of that. Yeah. And, and we're coming up on a time of genius. We're coming up a time, uh, on a time of, I never thought of that. I know what, what I've really gotten from your, your message today is, is the importance of being proactive in, Definitely. In, in terms of like thinking forward and thinking about how people are going to be living and, you know, just being, being proactive and being, being strong in the communication of those proactive ideas. You should yeah. always be proactive and you should always be thinking of what the bigger picture is. Don't, don't be trying to prognosticate the future. Mm. Try to just think about yourself or think about other people. Like what, how do you need to live? How do you want to live? And if you were in the, whatever the situation is that you're designing for, how, and this is, this is a basic design. This is design 101. Put yourself in the space. Yeah. And step that out. You know, if, put yourself in the space of the home, put yourself in the space of how you're getting to work. When you're at work, put yourself in the space of that. What do you need to make your day better? What would make your day better? What would, what would make your experience of the space more valuable? What would make you choose that space over another one? And if, as soon as you can do that, as soon as you can say, yeah, I would choose this space over that one because it's got A, B, C, D, whatever it is, you know, goat petting, fish farm, gold leaf, who knows, then that's something you can sell to somebody. And that's something that somebody can make more money out of. Fantastic. Excellent. Jeff, thank you so much for your time this morning and sharing your expertise. Thank you. It's been super fun. Absolutely brilliant. And the real kind of brought such an interesting broad perspective of, you know, both being able to understand the architectural perspective and the mind of an architect and the, and the role and also how that kind of dovetails into the work of developers and how the two can work together. So really appreciate your expertise this morning. Happy to be here. Fantastic. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.